thank you for that um, introduction. It's really so nice to be um, back at VCC, at least um, at least electronically. Um, so I, I mean, yeah, I, I, you've, David's done a, a, a typically thorough job of the biographical stuff. I probably wouldn't add too much to that. Um, but um, you know, maybe just a little bit. I guess this, this is Alumni Week. I mean, I was it was, um, and uh, you know, also thinking about this and talking to Jennifer about it uh, for the, the little piece that was uh, very kindly put up about it. I, I was made me think about my time at VCC, and I think um, um, I don't know. Maybe it started me off on um, you know, as as I as I continued in a way because I think it was. Uh, I mean, David mentioned that Wesleyan was a place where um, you know some of the things that I think, you know, in a, in a place like the University of Birmingham, which is not, you know, closed minded, but is a red brick, as they would say, um, British University, uh, you know, some of the sort of things about broadening, broadening curricula or looking at music in a, in a, a more diverse sense. Uh, I really felt like I got that from, from VCC, um, really from the start. And I actually came in sort of interesting in jazz, which was funny because I wasn't terribly good at it, if I'm honest. Um, but uh, it was one of the places you could do jazz. It was, it's actually surprisingly hard to do jazz in Vancouver, to study jazz in Vancouver at, at the institution in those days. Um, and I switched the, quickly switched to composition. Um, and I think I was just really very lucky, actually, as I've just been really lucky um, because I've been a little bit, um, I sometimes think that people, you know, the, the, the sort of the story that you get about um, your career is that, you know, you should find something that you're really good at and really focused on and you, you know, do that thing and, and kind of become that sort of person. Um, but I was, I don't know if it's just that I have a kind of, um, you know, short attention span or what it is, but I was always kind of just hungry for new things and exploring new things. And VCC was just really wonderful for kind of um, feeding me that, I think, and allowing for that and allowing, you know, people who were all sorts of different types of students who I think would have probably had a hard time, uh, well, not have a hard time, but wouldn't necessarily have been accepted into more traditional music programs. Um, so that was kind of, so even, even before I, and, and as I said, I mean, some of the things that we're, uh, talking about now, I feel like VCC had already worked out, you know, decades ago. Um, again, we don't have to talk about exactly when. Um, yeah, and Wesleyan was was very good for that. I I, I also remember the Gamelon procession. On the, and the other weird thing about that is that Clint Eastwood was in the procession. He was the honorary graduate, and so that was very strange. Um, and then I was in yes in Germany, um, where I did some. I was well, I was nominally studying at, in Karlsruhe at the. Music Hochschule, but uh, really I was just working at this place called ZKM and I'd sometimes go to classes with Wolfgang Riem, uh, which was the German education system is much less formal in the sense and they don't they don't really care if you come or if you don't come or what you do. So it was people were sort of coming in and out all the time. Actually, that was quite normal. Uh, yeah, and then as David said, ended up um, back in Toronto, which is perhaps not um, the University of Toronto might not be the, the sort of obvious place for me, but I'd I had a nice experience actually going there for a concert, some festivals. And I really liked people there and I really liked the seat and I really liked the city also again, because it was very diverse. And so that, that turned out to be quite a nice place as well. And then seemingly um, much to my amazement, kind of got a job um, uh, and came here. And as David said, I've been here since. And um, mostly teaching composition and that's you know I, I I so as I said I'm a little bit all over the place and uh I so I'm doing some instrumental composition I'm doing some um uh purely electronic music and I'm doing some mixed things and um there's various things we've had and some of that some of the electronic stuff is live and some of it's not so we have here this thing called Beast which is short for Birmingham Electric Acoustic Sound Theatre which is um it's like a hundred loudspeaker system for presenting electronic music. And that started, um, it will be 40 years ago this year by my, my now retired colleague, John T. Harrison. Um, and we also had like a laptop ensemble and things, which is kind of, that's had, well, that celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. Um, I don't, it's kind of a little bit ambiguous of whether that's still going or not. But um, So anyway, um, I thought I would talk about um, a project which kind of crosses over those things because it, it it's I never really know what's the best thing to talk about because again I feel like I just have a lot of different um, um, well I used to joke that I was sort of a renaissance person which was a nice way of saying that you're maybe mediocre at a large variety of things but uh, 
uh, this project crosses over into a number of things I thought it was maybe a good thing to talk about. Um, Zoom is sometimes weird when people do these kind of talks and people feel, you know, because you have your camera off, which is totally fine, of course, and everything, and people feel, um, but people feel like they don't want to just kind of leap in and ask a question. Um, so please, if you have a question or anything that I'm saying makes no sense at all or something, um, please do just kind of turn on your mic or pop something into the chat um, or whatever and just try to get my attention. And um, uh, I'll, I'm very happy to try to um, deal with those things that they go. Is that, is that all right? Yeah. Anything anybody wants to say before I kind of launch right into the topic or? No? OK, um, good. Uh, so I have, um, I'm afraid I actually do have like a, a kind of PowerPoint, so I'm going to switch to that if that's OK. Um, so the, um, the talk, so I'm just share my screen here. Um, the talk is called Dark Matter Creative Encounters with the Sound of New Physics, which is actually not a topic I, a title I came up with, it's something somebody else suggested, but um, uh, so basically, um, a few years, so we, we have um, in, in the university, we have this laptop ensemble, as I said, which is called the Birmingham Ensemble for Electroacoustic Research, uh, which spells beer, ha ha ha. Um, we, we, the university really likes acronyms, and so we thought we'd come up with one that sort of uh, made a little fun of that. Um, and uh, this has been around, as I said, since about 2011. And um, I think you guys have a laptop ensemble at BCC, actually, with Georgia, don't you? Is that is that right? I think that's true, or something we like still, this. We're still doing electric music, electronic music uh, here, Scott. And actually, Giorgio Manganese and uh, George Cooling are running that together at this point. Oh, okay. So, so we do have electronic music for sure. I know that um, I know that Giorgio had done a lot of kind of um, um, uh, live performance stuff, and we'd had we'd had Zach here actually as well, who would come from VCC, which is really nice. He's um, quite interesting in telling me about that. Uh, anyway, so we started this laptop ensemble, and this had been kind of going on for a while. Um, and this was um, uh, a project uh, that was kind of our particular focus was was uh, a couple of particular focuses. So one of them was what's called live coding, um, which is a bit nerdy, but it's basically it's like creating electronic music using algorithms that you can kind of rewrite while they're running, which sounds very fancy, but. Um, it's 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 a nice way to think about it. Maybe is um, uh, you know I think when you you do electronic music, you have to think about what your interface is, and and you know unlike with um, a violin, you you can you can easily change that. Um, so live coding is like a kind of interface that is really 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 flexible, but not necessarily very fast. Um, so it's actually working with code, and you're kind of setting these processes up, and then you kind of modify them as they go. Um, and then the other aspect of this was a kind of um, working with networked music systems. So we basically have um, computers networked together and sharing some kind of information or things like this. And um, uh, this is improvising um, usually, um, although there's usually some sort of structure. And so when I think about um, you know sort of post free jazz kind of improvisation, approaches if we talk about people like like John Zorn or Anthony Braxton who was at Wesleyan when I was there um, I, I think of these you know as kind of one of the things that's going on there's ways to try to impose structure on improvisation that isn't um, you know structured in in um, traditional ways so you sort of get to this free point where you're you can do things but then how do you say make everybody change together at the same time or how do you impose other types of order over it? so we were sort of using networking our computers together to try to do that so it might provide a form or a structure that we work in or or coordination in ways that's hard to do if you're just kind of improvising without anything in place so that was that was the ensemble um and then at some point um uh, Konstantinos Vasilakos, who's um, a Greek composer who teaches at um, Istanbul Technical University now. He was a member of the ensemble. Um, this is before he, he moved to Turkey. Um, and he met um, uh, uh, somebody who worked at CERN, which is, um, I, people probably have heard of CERN. Have people heard of CERN? Yes? No? Um, have you heard of the Large Hadron Collider? No, 
Okay. Yes. I I, yes. yes so indeed. <laughs> okay. So so well, if it's you know, if you don't know, I mean, so CERN is the big um, the big European um, um, atomic research center, which is kind of it kind of crosses the border um, with Switzerland and France and Italy, and it's. Um, uh, it has there the Large Hadron Collider, which is I, still, I believe, the largest particle accelerator in the world. And it's this huge big ring which goes under the ground under three countries. And um, basically, um, there's a number of experiments in the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the two big ones are called CMS and ATLAS, and they're basically doing the same thing. They're smashing protons together. And by smashing the protons together, they then kind of take a picture of what, what, what's there sort of an instant after that's happened. And then they try to um, basically add up what's there and, and see if it adds up to the weight of the two protons. And if it doesn't, um, they think that they found something new because um, there's something missing that they can't account for. And then they try to figure out what that is. So you, if you follow the news on this at all, the big thing a few years ago was the discovery of the Higgs boson, which I, I, I'm not a physicist and I don't really know that much about this, but um, uh, this was something that had been theorized for many, many years and, um, and they proved it. Um, so um, this is, as you can imagine, um, in terms of funded research, this is on a scale that, you know, people doing music based research can only <laughs> can't even can't even dream of right I mean so of course they have art projects associated with it so you know because to like allocate you know a couple of hundred thousand euros a year or something to an art project that's a rounding error for them right it's it's really it's petty cash um which is a bit strange sort of thing to kind of interface with but that's 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 essentially true so there's a project there called art at CMS and um Konstantinos met one of the people who worked there and just started talking about um, the kind of projects that they'd had uh, with artists working at CERN. And um, the sort of thing that they tended to get actually was um, sort of like paintings inspired by physics and things like this, um, which were all really, you know, it's nice and everything. Um, but Alex, the guy who was doing, they said they were a little frustrated with this, and Constantino said, well, why don't you get us to do something? We'll do something with your data. And they were like, oh, you want to do something with our data? Um, and they were kind of a little bit surprised by that, um, but also, you know, quite happy that somebody actually wanted to do that. Um, and so we um, sort of started working on a project there. It's, it's very nice. You know, they sort of assign you a physicist. Um, uh, so we worked with a couple of different physicists there, um, and it was, you know, actually got to go there at one point and um, do a performance, which was, um, I have to say, was just, um, it was really inspiring thing to do. Um, you, know, you sort of go there, and there really are just people from all over the world. Uh, when we arrived, they were so excited um, because they'd had the first Iranian physicist had come, and it's just, it's just kind of so collaborative. And it was also just nice to kind of show them what we were doing. And they were like, oh yes, you seem to actually understand this a little bit. So they were really happy to have artists doing that. So basically what we're doing is um, what's called sonification, um, which basically is a process by which you kind of take um, data and you use that to somehow generate sound. And there's different kind of approaches to that, um, but, the typical sort of approach that we would use is called parameter-based sonification. So basically you have a kind of synthesis algorithm and you're taking this data points and you're using that to parameterize your synthesis. Um, so if the data does one thing, it'll sound like one thing. So you could say, well, the weight of this particle, how heavy it is could control the pitch and the distance it is out from the center of the collision could control um the um duration or something like this or something else could control the timbre or something like this um so and this is um you know it's, a, it's there's a whole field around this people call auditory display sometimes and this is um not just for artistic purposes um people use sonifications the way that you would use a visualization so, I mean, what's, if you think about what's a visualization, the visualization 
is a way of taking perhaps a large and complex set of data and extracting some salience or meaning or something important out of it. So you, with the visualization, you can have a, a good visualization, which tells you something important about the data, or you can have a bad visualization, which um, you know, maybe hides the important things about the data. So, uh, you know, so for us, um, I think we were, we were trying to use this data in a way that, you know, you got some character or something from it that you wouldn't have just come up with yourself, right? So it's a kind of um, a way of generating some interesting, perhaps surprising musical material that you can, can use, yeah? Um, and yeah, we were working with this thing called the scouting stream and the scouting stream, I think it's already kind of old hat now, but in those days it was like, uh, it was sort of the, the, the raw edge of things with them because they have a huge, I didn't realize this. I always thought, I don't know if anybody's ever thought about particle accelerators, but when I thought about them, I thought they kind of set everything up and they go boom. And then they'd sit there thinking about it and analyzing it for a while. It's not like that. They turn it on for like weeks. And it's just collisions and collisions and collisions and collisions. So they have a massive data management problem there. Like it's huge, huge, huge amounts of data are being produced all the time. Um, and so they need to actually kind of decide what might be important. So the scouting stream was kind of the first um, way of kind of looking at what had come out and seeing what might be worth looking at more. So that's um, I, anyway, it's probably enough to say about that, but I, um, uh, that was what we were working with. Um, any questions about any of that? That might seem quite, esoteric and weird, I don't know, but um, no, does that make sense to everybody, more or less? Um, okay, so this um, sort of took over our lives for a few years, um, and we, we ended up doing like performances like all over the place with this, um, you know, we went around the UK and did things, and we did, you know, we did one in Canada, um, uh, at McMaster's, we were in Istanbul and Athens. We did a thing at CERN, which is uh, the CERN thing was very nice. It was basically their summer party. So we got to play for 800 physicists, which was uh, who were surprisingly receptive, actually. Um, and we had a residency in a village up in the mountains in Greece um, over Sparta, which um, uh, <laughs> was a kind of funny place to go. And we ended up playing for some olive farmers and stuff in the local taverna. And when I say local taverna, I mean like concrete floor and three different old kitchen tables from somebody's houses. And there was, you know, three or four people there. And, you know, other people were saying, oh, you know, you can't play that stuff there. They're going to kill you. And we went in and there's this kind of guy who looks really rough, kind of, and he was an Albanian <laughs> olive farmer. And somebody was translating and we, we played this piece and <laughs> the guy's translating and he says, oh yeah, yeah. It's, Sounds like Verdi. <laughs> We're like, what? Uh, but it was funny. And he he made this really um, um, kind of um, lovely sort of, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but there was this lovely thing about how threads went through and there were kind of melodies and developments and things. And, and it was, you know, not a kind of um, musicological way of talking about it, but it was, it was very, very insightful. And it just was one of those moments where I just thought, um, you know, don't ever assume what people will think about what you're doing. You don't know, um, and they will have surprising and interesting and um, um, you know perhaps exciting um, things to say about it. Um, and actually, I should say the the first performance of this project was actually in Birmingham, and um, uh, at a place called Birmingham Open Media, which is a kind of a, a technology based art gallery in the center of town, and. Um, I was really hit, you know, sort of struck by the responses that we got from the audience because I guess, you know, I'd um, not that I really believed in it, um, you know, but um, uh, I was taught about these kind of arguments between, um, you know, sort of, uh, well, in the 19th century sense, kind of program versus abstract music, right? And, you know, um, and of course, I, you know, I was. I was I was a VCC student, so I was raised to be critical and thoughtful about these sorts of notions. But the, you know, still, this idea that music that's about something, um, you know, is is maybe different or or whatever than music that's um, uh, not about anything or pure music, whatever we want to talk about that. Um, and of course, um, you know, I think actually, you know, somebody once pointed out to me, we, you know, all, most music is about something in some way, whatever that means. You know, we have these abstract contemporary music pieces, which are, you know, called 
things that are you know very evocative titles, very meaningful um, titles. Um, but you know, so when I think is this about physics, and of course people, um, you know, would listen to this and they sort of get this idea: oh, this is the sound of particle physics, or you could do one with climate change. They like, go, oh, this is the sound of climate change. Um, and, you know, in a way, what it's really the sound of is, is the sound of that data set going into that algorithm, which is translating it into sound, um, you know, so it's a lot more about your choices in some sense, but um, what kind of um, got me was that, that people found having that as a kind of framework to understand what they were hearing. Um, as a sort of maybe like a scaffold or something to hang their experience off, if you like, it just made it so meaningful for them. It just gave this kind of richness to it for them to know that we were working with this data, even if, even if it wasn't clear to them how those things related in, in a kind of direct way. Does that make sense? Um, so that was another kind of um, insight or, or a kind of um, way that this project, you know, gave me a more complex understanding of, of how pieces are about things or how things kind of um, relate to that. Um, right, so we had all these performances. We did a bunch of workshops on it for musicians and people. Um, and we had some kind of spin-offs. So there's a project called Ipsos, uh, which is the Interactive Physics Sonification System, which is a web app that we made. And we went around to schools and things um, and worked with kids on this and uh, did that in various places with younger kids. Um, we did this um, in a school in, in North Wales in a kind of quite um, uh, disadvantaged kind of area, which was very interesting with 40, 11 year old kids, which was terrifying. Um, but they did a performance with this thing, which was funny. And we, I did it with some teenagers in Toronto and various places I mean, and some teenagers in Athens and things like this. Um, and there's, um, a work for the Spree Orchestra that I did um, for Orchestra Electronics and Video, and I'll play that at the end, and I'm sort of moving towards that. And actually, I realized this, um, this uh, presentation is out of date because there was supposed to be something that somebody from the Barbican wanted to do um, as part of their, uh, they were doing a year of stuff with science and it never happened. So, uh, and the work with other instrumentalists never happened. So you can ignore that last bullet point. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Uh, right. Oh, so um, I just there's a little kind of um, trailer about this. So I thought maybe I would just play a bit of this. I might um, kind of jump ahead. Um, any any questions about anything so far? No. Yes. Go on. Scott. Um, yeah, I just wrote in the chat there was when you were talking about the. Uh, oh, sorry. The the hadron collider. Um, I was wondering, yeah, with that, that amount of data that you guys are taking in in the laptop ensemble, um, is it a, is it a, a process like, like quasi Cajun process where the data determines the, uh, the final audio result entirely? Or are you guys some, you know, manipulating the final result or like, you know, um, uh, like basically getting your hands on it and it's not entirely a, a process where you removed from the, um, you know, from the uh, contingencies of the data that's coming in. Yeah, it's a mix. I, I mean, I think so. One of the reasons to do this sort of thing is, um, you know, that it, it might give you something that you wouldn't have just come up with yourself. Uh, and I'm, you know, um, I'm uh, certainly, um, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say I'm modest enough because that sounds, <laughs> that sounds rather immodest, but like I'm, I'm, um, realistic enough about my my abilities as a composer that I, I I am not unopen to things that I am not didn't completely control or didn't completely plan and I think that's something nice about improvising or about you know just being open to some sort of process like this and and I and I and I really like the idea of composing as a kind of playful activity as well you know that you're exploring and you're finding things rather than you know you're just this have this vision or something. I don't have I don't have visions like that. So um, yeah, so so it's it's quite nice for that. Um, but you know, you're also you're you're making quite a lot of choices. Um, and one of the things I think if you look at kind of 
you know, if you if you want to try to make a spectrum of things from cage to something that's completely controlled or something, I mean, cage is still controlling things, right? You know, so so it's it, in that sense, it's kind of like you know, we're probably controlling more than cage was certainly in the kind of middle late part of his career. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it's a, it's a spectrum, right? So, what are you controlling? What are you not controlling? Um, and um, and you know, and it it tends to go through kind of cycles of intervention. So, you know, if you don't like something, you change it. Um, uh, yeah, I'll I'll do a little demo maybe in a minute. Um, but yeah, sorry, I didn't see that in the chat. Um, really, really, just turn on your mics and um, and also like I I can't see everybody. Um, just because I'm sharing the screen now, I can't see everybody's little window. So if somebody waves their hand, I might not notice. So just yeah, did, was that did I answer your question? Was that good? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'll just play a little bit of this um, trailer. It's like five six minutes, so I don't want to play all of it, but um, let's just play a bit of that. Uh, hopefully, you can hear this. Yeah, good. So this is this is actually the premiere. Somebody did this really nice video, which is artfully out of focus at nice moments. <laughs> so, uh, Oh, and there's a visualization sometimes as well. Some of them are quite abstract. Um, some of them are less abstract. So this is um, the graphics are somehow um, in some way visualizing the collisions that are being sonified. Um, and then there's also um, code being projected. So there's this kind of funny thing that people do with live coding where they um, project their code. And um, I think of it a little bit as like watching somebody play the bassoon, you know, like, like, I don't really know what's going on. I mean, if you don't play the bassoon, you, you don't really understand the fingerings and stuff, but you it's, it somehow makes it performative to just show that people are doing things. Um, so I might just leap ahead a little bit here. Um, just give a little bit of variety. And it, it would vary, you know, it's been anything from like two to five people doing this, depending on who was available for each performance. Uh, this is in Athens, I think. Um, this is, oh wait, sorry, I wanted. Oh yeah, this is, um, this is actually at CERN, and they actually had this weird kind of um, inflatable structure, which some art people made, and you could go inside and project on it. Uh, and this is in um, Hamilton, and that's another different sort of visualization there. Uh, that's, this kind of visualization is probably closer to what the collisions actually look like, if you like. Um, and yeah, I think that's just another shot inside there at CERN. So um, that's just a little taste of, of that. Um, uh, so I'll just go back to this. I'm going to move along maybe a little bit quickly here because I, I don't want to run out of time. But um, yeah, so I mentioned, uh, I think I already covered some of this about sonification. So um, I will uh, sort of go over this again. Um, so there's this, one of the problems here is mapping. Um, and this is just, a, a, it gives you a kind of sense of uh, maybe just a, a little bit of an inkling of what the data looks like, if you like. So there's um, basically you take these, um, we have we get a, what you get is a kind of list of um, of subatomic particles um, that are 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 detected after the collision, and you know where they are, um, and and maybe their weight and some things like this, um, and this is. This is actually presented in this kind of weird thing called pseudo rapidity. So you can see um, here are these kind of um, eta and phi and these parameters down the bottom there that you actually get. It doesn't. You don't need to worry so much what they mean. There's sort of angle and distance and things like this. But you you could map them and then so maybe for each collision that you have, you could iterate over the subatomic particles and sonify them and get a kind of pattern or something. For example, that would be one thing you could do. 
Uh, and this is a nice little video from CERN. And so that just gives you a sense of it goes boom. And then you, you sort of, it's like a photograph in a way that's taken like an instant after the collision. Um, and that was um, that was done by, by Tom McCauley, who's um, one of the physicists that we work with. Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna kind of skip over that because I've sort of already said it. So I'll do, I'll do the, just a little live coding demo. Um, I hope this will work. It's sometimes a little bit weird over um, Zoom, but I'll see if I can make this work. I think it should work. Um, so when we um, play together, we have a kind of a, a chat and we can see all the code that other people have executed. So we can we can copy what other people have done and modify it and, and change it. Um, here, I'm just loading in um, a really big data file of data that they gave us um of collisions which takes a minute uh and then i get this interface and normally the way we did this is there was kind of this idea that your these are just all different physics events here and i can kind of get a look at them see how many particles there are um i can see some information down here about what the range of parameters are which is helpful for mapping and we have this kind of concept that there's a, a active event. So I've selected one and I've made it active. And that's the event I'm sonifying. Um, by event, I mean collision. That's the, the term that they use. Um, yeah, and so this is kind of just helpful for browsing. And you can see that some of them have, you know, quite a few particles and some of them have, you know, maybe not, not as many or they're kind of more in one direction or something. Um, so I'm not going to explain everything that's going on here, but I'll just kind of, um, I've got some kind of boilerplate stuff I've done here. And I could maybe, um, I think, I haven't had time to really go through this, but I think this one's a kind of a, a drony sort of sound. So that makes a nice background. And then I can maybe um, make something that's more like a rhythm. So that's kind of um, that's like just going through all the the particles in this event one by one, and you can hear if I change the event, the character changes. So that's kind of nice. You can have the same algorithm and then see what different data put in does. And then the, the live coding thing is I could sort of go in and say, okay, you know, I want to make that like um, faster. So I'll, or even faster. Or um, uh, I don't know, I could like add another layer here. So this one is a sort of a rhythm thing. Could you hear that actually? Sorry, I should have asked that before. <laughs> this happened to be once on Zoom. I was sort of like two or three minutes into something like that before I noticed that the chats were frantically saying, oh my God, I can't hear it. Yes, um, Scott, we could hear it all. That was fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, um, uh, so as I said, you know, like one of the things that um, with live coding, as I said, it's very flexible, but it's not necessarily fast, right? So I've got some kind of stuff I prepared here. Um, it would take me a long time to type this out, but once I've typed it out, it's not very hard to kind of modify it, you know? Um, uh, and, you know, and when you're playing with four or five people, there's more space to do that. But there's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, maybe a little bit separate from um, the general discussion of the project, it's a, but, but it's, it's an interesting interface. And it, it's interesting to think about something like this in terms of, you know, compared to like building an instrument, which is kind of preset, I can sort of just change the sounds, I can, change anything I want in a way, um, but it might take me a while to do it. So that has all sorts of implications for how you might work and what kind of music you might make, and things like this. But it's um, it's been a, a fun sort of thing to do. Um, there's a, a whole community around that, by the way, um, 
you know, of people who do these things, including these things called algo raves where people like live code dance music. It's, it's, it's so like actually weirdly really cool and really fun and also incredibly, incredibly committedly nerdy. And I, I, I have to admit, I quite like that. <laughs> uh, some of the people are terrible, terrible dancers too, which just, just somehow adds to that sort of nerd mystique, um, if that makes any sense. Um, any, any questions about any of that before I sort of move on to the next thing? No? Um, okay, good. Um, I'll go back to this then. Um, oh, yeah, so we, we do have one now that now that you've moved on, but oh, really I have a question. quickly. Yeah. Um, so with the coding, I mean, it's purely the interface is, is you and your keyboard, like you're typing in the code. Like yeah. you don't have, for instance, um, you know, sliders and faders and maybe like, uh, I don't know, maybe shorthand things or X, Y, chaos pads and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so you can do stuff like that too, of course. Um, and I mean, actually, well, there is, um, I mean, this is a, a GUI for selecting events. And then over here, I've, I've actually got a kind of little mixer thing and I've got some um, effects and things. So, I mean, I could like, um, I could take that and plug it in. Why are you not working? Work. Oh dear. Okay, it's not working right now. Theoretically, I could take that and drag that over there and patch it in, but it's decided to be difficult now. Um, but um, yeah, uh, so I mean, as a, you know, one of the ways you overcome the limitations of that interface is by combining it with interfaces which are good at other things. So live coding is not good for doing a, a crossfade, but sliders can be okay for that. Um, uh, we did a, well, we did a piece with some, um, Pianist Zina Pistova, where we were, the computers were listening to what she was playing and getting a kind of something that looks like a piano roll in the end, um, where you could just kind of grab the last 10 seconds or last couple of seconds of what she played and then try to turn that into code and do something with it. But we found um, with that, for instance, that it was by the time we'd actually grabbed what she'd done and coded it into something, it was like, she'd moved on so quickly because she could just produce notes so fast <laughs> and, and we're really like oh like it's weird like you're not thinking about what you're going to do now usually you're thinking about what you're going to do in 20 seconds or a minute or something like this so um so we actually came up yeah with this kind of piano roll thing that just sort of scrolled across and you could just grab it and it would pop up and generate code which you could immediately play and then change um so you know that's an, another interesting discussion about this of like how do you deal with the limitations of interfaces and i guess it's one of the great challenges of electronic music is you can make your own interface um but you know that has trade-offs they're not you know one of which is that you're never going to be as good as the average violinist is on their violin because you're not going to spend 10 years learning it um sorry that's i'm i'm getting a little bit um into a um uh it's getting a bit parenthetical there but um i'm, I'm a bit bad for that so I'll, I'll stop now maybe but does that sort of answer your question so so yes, yes, you can and should combine it with other things if that makes sense. And um, uh, actually it's something I'd maybe like to do a little more of in the future. Um, right, so we got, um, um, you know, cause one of the kind of connections with um, the CMS, Art at CMS project is, is education stuff. And they were like, well, this is all kind of cool but it'd be really nice to have something to do with, with kids. Um, and with kids, you can't like, you know, give them your, um, so that, that language that I'm working in there is called super collider, <laughs> uh, ironically, completely coincidentally. Um, uh, but you know, you can't just give them your super collider code and say, okay, 11 year old kids work with this. Um, so they said, could you come up with something that was a little bit easier to kind of work with? And so we came up with this thing called Ipsos, which is a web app. So it just runs in a web browser. So anybody can use it um which is really nice again just to get people to play with it um and um so basically we we tried to sort of set this up as something where you could learn a little bit about physics and you could learn a little bit about sonification and you could learn a little bit about classic synthesis stuff uh and sort of have fun with it um and so we did the app and we workshopped it with a bunch of kids and then we um uh of various ages and then um, actually, uh, a couple of um, grad students here, um, uh, Emma Margotson and Milad Mardike, did uh, a much, much better job than I ever could have done doing documentation and resources and support on the whole thing. 
Um, so I might just show you, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on that. You can actually go play with it if you want, um, but I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, so basically you get an interface that looks like this and you can select different um, events and you can, sorry, it's distorting a little bit, or you can listen to them as a chord or you can listen to them as a sequence. And then you can kind of like um, add it as a preset. And then we could select another one here. Uh, let's change the sound maybe. So I hope that's not too loud, but I could. And then you can just. Ah, sorry, really loud. Um, apologies for that. Uh, oh, question. Oh, yeah, getting close to 345. Okay. Uh, if, if people don't need to go, I'll just kind of go on until I'm done. Sorry, I've, I've, I've been a bit too slow, but yeah, thanks for the. The, um, the other thing. Um, yeah, and then there's this really nice um, set of support materials here. Uh, so you can, this is, this bit is just kind of instructions about the thing and there's a demo video, um, but you, there's a whole section on particle physics and tells you stuff about that. And then um, there's cute little graphics. Um, and then there's something about sound synthesis and tells you some basic stuff about that. And, um, if I just go back here, I think, um, yeah, um, uh, I was I was a little worried when we did this because it, it sounds a little hokey and a little bit obnoxious. Um, but weirdly enough, the first time we really road tested it was um, in Toronto. Um, so weirdly, when I this orchestra piece that I did um, at the same time as that was going on, we had um, oh this is sorry this is kids in Wales doing this, um, and this is in Athens, but. Yeah, at the same time I was in Toronto for this orchestra piece, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, there was um, some of the people from Art at CMS were in Toronto working with school physics teachers at the Ontario Science Centre, and they said, can you come and do something? And so we went there and um, we got these high school kids, and you know what high school kids are like, teenagers, or it can be really, really difficult to work with. Um, but we gave them this stuff, we talked about the physics, we talked about the synthesis system, we gave them tablets with this thing, and we said, now just do some improvisations. And they immediately started making things that sounded like um, farts and doorbells and stuff like this. And I thought, oh my God. And then they, I, then they started doing these little performances and I realized like, oh no, this is brilliant, because they think it's funny. And if they think it's funny, they're paying attention. Um, so actually it kind of worked. Um, well, that's that's uh, Konstantinos just over there uh, on the right-hand side there with the, uh, with the beard. Um, so this is, this is in Toronto. You can see what they're like. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, so that's Ipsos. Uh, and then the last thing, um, I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. So um, the last thing is, is uh, any, any questions about that just before I go on? Sorry, I'm going quite quickly here. Okay, uh, the last thing was this project with the Esprit Orchestra, which again, I, 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 I'm not very, I, I've, again, I feel like I just keep happening into things like this project is a great project. And I mean, it was just cause it was Konstantinos made it happen. Um, and, you know, and I, I, I thought this was good and I pitched it to the Esprit Orchestra, um, which I almost never really have the guts to do. And much to my amazement, they were interested in it. Um, so I was felt very lucky about that actually. Um, and they said, yeah, you know, I said, <laughs> I said, I'd like to do a piece, you know, for large orchestra and electronics and video. <laughs> and they actually said, yes, um, it's not the most portable thing, but, um, you know, there you go. Um, so I, um, I didn't want to do live coding with it and improvisation because, you know, orchestra is particularly, um, I mean, the Esprit Orchestra is kind of amazing because they, they are an orchestra which does just contemporary music, but it's not, um, you know, it is in a sense like a pickup orchestra. They don't get a lot of rehearsals. They really put things together fast. So you can't probably, uh, you know, you can't have people sitting around while you're working out your improv or, um, you, know, work, you know, working out complicated tech things. It has to be very, very organized. Um, so I thought, okay, everything will be kind of pre-done, but the, so all of the electronics were pre-done um, and the, um, um, the uh, video is 
sort of similar visualizations to the ones that you saw, but the ones that you saw in the other video, we were they were generated in real time um, because they had to be because we were improvising, but these ones didn't have to be. Um, so I decided that I would try to teach myself Blender, uh, which was again like uh, it's, it's a kind of um, I don't know if anybody's encountered this, but it's a kind of animation program, uh, and I I don't know again I just I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but um, I you know I I. I, I, I have a short attention span, as I said, so I thought, oh, something new. So I, I did that. And the nice thing with Blender is that there's, um, there's a, a research um, computing cluster at the university here, which is just like, you know, racks and racks and racks of Linux computers. And um, you can get time on it as a researcher to, to do things like crunch physics data and stuff like this, but I was, but it has Blender on it. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm going to log on to this thing and ask it to like render my um, time consuming uh, animation of this sonification of this physics data, um, which seemed quite fun. And it was, and they took a really long time to do probably because I, to be honest with you, because I just didn't really know how to make it efficient. Um, but yeah, so that was fun. Um, and uh, basically in this piece, um, there's three movements um, and the instrument. So I, I made the sonifications in a similar way to what I did with the live coding ones for the electronic parts. And then the instrumental parts kind of come out of, the, out of um, that in, in, in three different ways. Um, so there's kind of straight sonification. So like the, the first movement is the the, the what the orchestra plays is actually a sonification itself. So instead of taking that data and generating synthesis data, I'm generating pitches. And then I orchestrated that. Uh, and there's a kind of a, another sonification electronically that goes along with it. Um, and, um, you know, double things at octaves and stuff like that. And then, you know, kind of rationalize the notation because the rhythms that the the sonification generated were sometimes a bit nuts um, from a kind of practical perspective. So that was kind of rationalized a bit. Um, in the second movement, especially, there's kind of imitative material that's inspired by the sonification. So there's sort of verbally things that come out um, and then accompaniments, I guess you could say, that go around that. Um, yeah, and then there's accompaniments and things that are um, drawing on imitation or similar sort of harmonic schemes. Um, and uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, there's some kind of funny tuning things in there. I've been interested in kind of strange tunings and scales and things like that for a long time too. So um, I'll see if anybody can figure out what the scale is in the last movement. That's a very, probably, don't worry if you can, it's a sort of nerdy thing to suggest, but um, um, yeah. So there's a little bit of that in there as well. Um, as I said, the visualizations were, were um, the same, uh, similar sort of thing, but not real time. Um, and there's actually screenshots of them in the um, uh, frames of them are in the background of this talk. All right, so I'll play you the video. Um, so I hope that this comes across um, okay. Um, it's about 15 minutes long, the whole thing. Um, uh, is that okay? Do we have enough time for that? We can go a little bit longer. Yeah, okay. So. Um, this is, um, oh yes, yeah, so I should say this is, um, uh, they were very nice to let me record it and video it, but it was, you know, um, the contract is, um, <laughs> was a bit strict. So they said there could be one camera at the back. Um, amusingly enough, one of the guys from CERN, who I don't think goes to concerts a lot, but we, he, he wanted to go to the concert. So we got him a comp and he sat at the side with his camera and filmed it <laughs> from the side without having permission. <laughs> Um, and so there's actually two cameras and then the graphics are a little bit layered over it. Um, so that was kind of lucky, I guess, as well. Um, any, any questions about any of that before I play the piece? Okay, I got one flat, two flat, three sharp, four, but, but uh, that was only the big, low sustained thing. So my hearing may not be working. Scott, it's, <laughs> it's just beautifully orchestrated. Uh, oh, thank you. So, so clear and so, so lucid. Um, just, just really quite impressive in all sorts of ways. Um, but I suspect we've got a fair number of questions. So if you're prepared to stay up just a little bit later, yeah, uh, sure, sure. Uh, um, can uh, people just unmute and and join in th join in the fiesta here? Since I, I don't, it's funny that I, I mean I'll tell you what it is. Is that actually it's it's basically a kind of pelog 
in the last movement, uh -huh. which has nothing to do with anything at all, except that I happen to rather like it. So, <laughs> um, so I don't usually mention that to people just because I feel like it's, it loads it with things that it doesn't need to be loaded with, but um, it's, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's not, and it's nice. It's thank you for saying it, of the orchestration. I sometimes feel I, that that concert. There was a, the first piece on the program was a beautiful, like really amazingly beautifully orchestrated set of songs by Chris Harmon, mm -hmm. um, who I think is, you know, certainly of people around my age is probably one of the best orchestrators uh, in Canada for my generation. I would say, and I mean, I so to be on that concert. Sometimes I feel, you know, I remember thinking like, oh well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing that and I've got these nice little things that go plinkety plink plink but um <laughs> it was um uh uh but you know it, it ended the first half and it had a nice um I think that worked well and Jordan Peterson of all people cornered me in the foyer and asked me questions about it which was very disconcerting actually you should have bit him on the finger <laughs> yeah honestly, I can't even remember what he asked I was just so sort of um I was just sort of Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, uh, I think he's asked me what I thought I was doing. But, um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, and yeah, any questions from anybody really um, about any of it? Um, Soterios, I know you're bursting, so come on in. <laughs> oh, I can't, I, I, can't, I can't hear you. Are you. You're not muted though. This is odd. Oh yes, we've lost. Nope. This is the one. Oh, there, there you go. go. There Very good. Go. <laughs> yeah, uh, just if I go on, yeah, anybody just cut me off. Yeah, I have a few. Uh, just really quickly, I wanted to say sure. that um, it's good you played that because I've been wanting to, to catch up uh, on your music oh. since, uh, since the CD. Which, oh, gosh. Uh, I, heard, I think I, I wrote you once that it was like, um, you know, it's, I think it's 2001 and uh, it's, it still sounds great. Like it really doesn't sound dated. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, you speak of orchestration, but yeah, your, your sense of timbral qualities, um, uh, you know, re really evocative. And that's the stuff that really makes it, um, uh, you know, really appealing and, and why it, it's not, you know, it's not dated to a, you know, to a specific program. Like I was thinking the other day, um, you know, with the, Barry Truax, you know, his, uh, his granular synthesis, you know, when he came up with that in the eighties, like th the first recordings of it sounded great. And it was like, oh, this is just like, mm. and they still sound great. And it was like, yeah, this is what it's really for. And then everybody got the technology and yeah. it became easier to use. And then it just became everywhere. And then it's just like, oh no, whenever I hear that, that, that whoosh now, I'm like, oh no, not, not <laughs> you know, there should be it's a tax a, on, on, on granular synthesis now. <laughs> well, we, we, it's a problem with when nice things become cliches, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, actually, I won't, I won't, um, I, sh I, sh I shouldn't tell you this, but um, uh, as we're among friends, um, I mean, I, I happen to see, um, uh, so we have a research assessment exercise and they get in external readers to try to, um, you know, guess what the grades will be. And um, somebody was brought in to read on this piece. And um, I actually know who it is. I shouldn't, but I know who it is because I could tell by the way they wrote. And um, I won't tell you who it was, but that person basically went on about octaves and bombasticness. So it's funny that you say that it, wasn't, it was fresh, but um, uh, yeah, it's, well, it is funny, um, but you're, you're quite right. And I think, um, you know, with electronic music as much as anything, it's, um, it's easy for things, even if they sound nice, to become kind of cliches and dated. And um, and actually, I think one of the things that 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 you know people of maybe Barry's generation, which I think had a quite idealistic idea about electronic music, that it was going to be very neutral and very and very abstract. Actually, that this was kind of again like not grounded in the world, you know. And there's all that kind of if you look at you know. Pierre Schaeffer and all this stuff. There's this idea of we must separate. We just have timbre, and we're not interested in relationships to the world and everything. Um, you know, and then it's like, yeah, granular synthesis, Barry Truax, you know, <laughs> you know like 1992, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and people are taking these things that are supposed to be very abstract. I mean, Barry was never like that, to be fair, but, you know, um, finding them grounded in that way. And I think that's something that, um, uh, yeah, people have had to come to terms with. And, and weirdly, I have too, because I was somebody who's like, you know, I, I kind of came along when these real-time computer music programs are really taking off. And I was like, yeah, why would you want 
an object why would you want to synthesize it right and now um now everybody's getting all these retro things and making new ones and they're like oh look at this knob you know <laughs> this kind of feels, it's like unboxing videos of like synthesizer modules and people sort of lovingly <laughs> and i sort of thought oh maybe i'm maybe i'm misunderstanding something about this but um, anyway sorry that was a long answer to a straight no no that's yeah. that's wonderful yeah i i maybe maybe it's um maybe something towards the future i i that kept i i don't think yeah with a lot of uh, culturally speaking with music that it's it's so much of a linear progression. I think things are cyclical. And yeah. so I think, you know, once once something's become oversaturated, like um, say like Ableton and laptops or something like that, then, then there's a there's a strong reaction then to, yeah. to inefficient analog stuff and, and that sparks a new kind of creativity. But well, my, having my, said that though, sorry, having said sorry. that though, thinking about the future, one thing um, I, I've been getting into, um, you know, since, uh, you know, quarantining and, and spending a lot of time reading and stuff is um, um, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were mentioning earlier with the, uh, you know, about um, this kind of like negotiation between, um, you know, like, say the data came in from the CERN um, um, source and and sparked something new that you couldn't have thought of by yourself. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm interested about the, the melding of AI and music. It's not so much algorithmic music, where we type in the parameters and let it go. Mm. And here we have a Mozart sonata, a la David Cope or something. Uh, I was thinking more of something where it's actually that there's that there's feedback and there's interaction, kind of like mm. Bayesian statistics. If that's not too nerdy, but it's like that sense where you're, you know, you 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 type you you punch in something, some variation comes up that you know maybe no other human could have come up with, and that sparks up a, a you know a new idea, and suddenly you're like you're writing a sonata in real time like 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 your procedure i don't know if you have anything to say about um the, this this future of uh, ai and music and um yeah um it's not something that i've like um really done a lot with if i'm totally honest um you know i follow it a bit and i'm aware of it um you know and i mean it, it feels to me like we're that we're a little bit at a different stage now um because uh you know when i was first being aware of that it was more things like people using um uh sorry i don't want to get too nerdy for people who won't know what i'm talking about there's this thing called a self-organizing map which is a kind of neural net and and so what that's useful for is if you have like say a whole bunch of different settings or something you know it's it's a nice way of organizing complex multi-dimensional sets of things and making them into a, a, like a two-dimensional kind of interface or something that's that's simple to deal with so there's those kind of things and those kind of applications but i think now you know it's like really um the stuff that's going on is is quite surprising and you know so much of what's going into hardware development and everything is to support that kind of stuff and it's really getting specialized and so i don't know a lot about it but i and i don't you know i, I hesitate to predict the future but i what i would say is that everything that people say is not going to happen i don't believe them <laughs> you know and particularly when they say things like oh the computers won't take over and they won't write music and people won't like the music if they do write them I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> I think that's I think that's all going to happen and worse, or or better or more. You know, worse is maybe it's it's it, it kind of it doesn't matter whether it's better. Whereas that's a matter of opinion, I suppose. But I think um, I mean I'm not worried about that in the way that some people are for the creativity of the human race. Um, you know, um, you know people were worried about sampled French horns, um, you know, being used on soundtracks. I don't I don't think that's you know it might have taken you know it's perhaps been bad for the French horn business, but I think um, it hasn't, you know, people have just found other ways to be creative and do things. Um, and I suppose this is, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, those implications, now the, the moral and ethical implications of these things, those are, those are complicated and thorny and I'm hesitant to say anything about them because I try not to say, <laughs> I don't always succeed, but I try not to say too many dumb things about things that I don't know that much about. <laughs> so, um, I saw somebody There's one give... guy I follow. Um, he's it's another Canadian out in 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 England too. I think he's out at Hutter, Huddersfield, maybe. Um, Pierre Tremblay. Yeah, I know Pierre. Uh, yeah, 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 and he's doing some stuff. I, it's it's a little beyond me. Like I'm really just dipping my toes, really, you know. Um, but yeah, he's got something called Flucoma. 
Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, they got a it. they got a lot of money for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I no, think he, he's done a lot where he's integrated, um, you know, live. Um, like he's a bass player, and you know, so he's he's playing bass to uh, solo electric bass to, you know, some like incredible stuff, and it's like. Was that a soundtrack that that he's just you know spent months you know uh, making? And I was like, no, it's like like on the spot, and uh, and so there's there's a little bit of that relationship. Like I guess that's the concern I had was more that there was a relationship there as opposed to um, just purely letting parameters go. Oh yeah, I, I mean I had a so this is a, maybe a silly story, but I um I often it's it's weird. So I've gone to these different places which have different ethos, and it's weird when I'm there. I always feel like I have to resist a little bit. Then I go somewhere else. So I came here. I started teaching an experimental music course because I was at Wesley, and then I they did all that stuff, and nobody's doing here. But um, you know, so I I have a friend of mine is this guy Nick Collins, and he um, he's in Durham now. But he 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 made these things like he made a kind of a, a program that would like generate Japanese pop songs. So he was kind of messing around with this. It's quite funny. It's it's, it's surprisingly convincing, actually. And um, uh, and and what was really funny is the interface was so opaque. Right, it would just say like go, and it would just do it. And you, kind of, you don't know how you parameterize it or anything. Um, but then he made one that basically tried to make you know avant-garde um, acoustic electroacoustic music. Um, which he called autocosmatic, and he he generated pieces from this, and he was entering them in competitions and hoping that he would win a first prize and things like. And he would do it actually. He was very rigorous about it. He would do it without listening to the piece. He just send it off with a fake bio. And but anyway, so I thought I'd cause trouble here with my colleagues, and I invited him for a talk, you know, and to talk about these things. And I thought it would piss him off and it piss off the students. And I, I was, you know. I'm childish enough to sometimes think that it's nice to kind of foment a little controversy. So uh, he comes and he does the talk and he's explaining how it <laughs> works. And, you know, sure enough, I'm completely foiled because my colleague Jaunty just goes, this is fantastic. This will make my life so much easier. <laughs> well, you're telling me I can feed this a corpus of music that I like and it will give me similar material. This is the best thing I've ever heard of. Do you know how hard it is to do this? <laughs> sort of like, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is interesting. So did anybody else want to ask anything? Actually, I don't kind of want to, um, I don't want to cut you off, but um... I want to lower the tone because sure, yeah. by, by throwing in, um, you know, we have this disarming habit of producing composers who need to go places. What's it like uh, to go to grad school in England and which universities other than as, as well as your own, but others would you think are worth a shot for, uh, for people who have got the, <clears throat> the VCC degree and, and are just ready to go on? Also, if you could let us give uh, give give us an approximate uh, notion of how much it costs, because you know we know um, what American schools run, but um, but what about the uh, the UK ones? Yeah, it costs a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could check what it is in Birmingham now, but I think it's like um, ballpark. <laughs> yeah, I think for a PhD overseas, it's like twelve or fifteen thousand pounds. Um, and for so, top masters, it might even be a little more than that. Um, yeah, thirty thousand. Yeah, so it's be. not it's not far away from the American schools. For oh, they've got they're getting to sixty now. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, and there is there is funding, um, uh, but not as much as you might hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, you know, it's kind of um, I don't know what to say about that except that. Um, uh, so if I shouldn't be saying things like that because that sounds discouraging and I'm supposed to encourage people to, <laughs> to come. Um, yeah, so which places to go? Um, there's, it sort of depends what you want. And I think, um, you know, if, if you're doing, if you're looking at like um, a PhD, I mean, obviously you need to think about who you want to work with um, and facilities and things. Um, and I guess, you know, um, here we distinguish between a top masters where you'd have coursework and then research masters where you just do a kind of project. Um, but, um, you know, so certainly, um, do you, do you want to like for composition or for everything? A uh, comp mainly, I think we've got, yeah. uh, we've got a um, couple of people who are lurking in this discussion who are, are starting to think about it. Okay, I mean, I, so I think the, the best thing to do is find a teacher who you 
want to work with or a place that offers something or a, a you know or a city that offers something uh, I mean like I said when I went to Toronto I was probably more interested in the city than I was in the teachers although actually I was you know there were very good teachers there and I got a lot out of them but, um uh yeah so I mean Manchester um is another place where people go um it's um also has a lot of electronic music um the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, which is kind of our friends across town here, are I think quite interesting in a kind of um, sort of British wing of the Hague School, sort of Dutch kind of post minimalist and a little bit absurdist music kind of way, um, amongst other things. Um, there's, I mean, there's so many, so many. Um, places you could mention. I mean, until very recently, um, you know, I would have mentioned Brunel, which is a place that has some problems, I think, but but Christopher Fox is a is a is a teacher who many Canadians have come to work with. Um, although he's sort of retired now, I think. So I don't really know how easy it is to kind of or semi-retired. Um, I think Huddersfield is really interesting um, and quite a mixed place. It's a, you know, what they would call a former polytechnic. Um, so it was sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of like the, the sort of universityification of things that has gone on in lots of places um, in, in a good way in many places. I think, I think Huddersfield is sort of like VCC in that, you know, it became a university. And then the weird thing that happened is because um, there's pressure for universities to do research um polytechnics that that had conservatoires or music programs and they're often the music programs became like their flagship thing because they they could do research um so they had a lot of investment um so pa is very interesting uh monty atkins there is very interesting um there's a guy there named alex harker who was actually one of our students who i think is incredibly bright tech person really just i mean way smarter than me um, which was was interesting to deal with when he was a student here. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I think Liza Lim is still there, actually. I don't know if you know her, but kind of us She's great. Yeah, Australian um, composer. Um, yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's the Royal College and the Royal Academy. I'm I've never been super keen on those places personally, but I mean, some people have good experiences there. Um, I'm trying to think who I know there who's a good teacher really. Um, I mean, those places, they're certainly kind of good places to go to like get plugged into kind of like the mainstream British contemporary music scene. So, I mean, if you sort of think Aldborough and that kind of stuff, um, those are definitely places which have those kinds of connections. Um, Goldsmiths remains an interesting place, I think, um, in lots of ways. Um, interesting crossovers with the computer people and Atau Tanaka is still there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just sort of depends what you want. I mean, there's, right. there's so many places. It's kind of, it's, there's so many universities here. It's a little bit, it's almost it's almost it's kind of troubling <laughs> well and you know we're used to looking south of the border and saying well there's a university in almost every state and so on and so forth but we don't yeah 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 we don't I know mean, the uk ones nearly as well and there's just as much diversity and 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 possibilities yeah. look um we're we're getting on i mean we don't want to keep you up well past midnight but oh, uh, if anybody's okay. got any any quick questions for scott please please come on in and and uh, and ask them um going once going twice well they sort of know where you can be found scott wilson okay. at birmingham university uh thank you so much for coming in and uh, sharing i loved hearing the orchestra piece that was uh that was a, a great joy i'm still you know i don't understand the physics but then you know in another <laughs> incarnation maybe i will have a better better grasp of I, this i think there are many david duke or orchestration uh tricks in there <laughs> to be fair <laughs> i think you know I, I think you know you've thieved from all of the greats and that's exactly how one learns how to orchestrate yes i think so <laughs>